thank you everyone for coming to Word on the Street this year. It's a little bit different, so I really appreciate everybody coming out um, to listen online. I'm really excited to hear from Robert today. So before we begin, I'm just going to do um, a land acknowledgement. So the Lethbridge Public Library acknowledges that we are gathered on the lands of the Blackfoot people of the Canadian Plains and pays respect to the Blackfoot people, past, present, and future, while recognizing and respecting their cultural heritage, beliefs, and relationship to the land. The city of Lethbridge is also home to the Métis Nation of Alberta, Region 3. So um, we are very excited to have Robert today. So Robert J. Sawyer has been called the Dean of Canadian Science Fiction by the Ottawa Citizen and Canada's answer to Michael Creighton by the, uh, by the Toronto Star. A member of both the Order of Canada and the Order of Ontario, Rob is one of the eight writers in history to win all three of the world's top awards for best science fiction novel of the year. The Oppenheimer Alternative explores the moral ramifications of the Manhattan Project. Um, and if you're interested in purchasing any of Robert's books, um, there are signed ones available uh, through the University of uh, Lethbridge Bookstore um, by visiting the Watts um, Festival website um, at any time. So welcome, Robert. Thank you so much, Caroline. Thank you for having me here. First off, I send my regrets for not being there in person. Obviously, everybody knows why. It's COVID-19. I had an absolutely spectacular time the last time I was in Lethbridge, which was not that long ago. I was at WordBridge, the annual literary writing and uh, readers uh, festival, patterned after Randy McCharles's When Words Collide Festival in Calgary. I see Randy is in the audience here amongst the organ organizers of WordBridge with my friend Alicia Visser, who I also see her name in the audience there. And of course, my great friends, Elizabeth Hegeret, who is the librarian at the Lethbridge uh, Public Library and her uh, uh, spouse, Barb Geiger, who is a very fine writer in her own right, uh, were also very kind to me when I was last there. So I really am kind of bummed because, you know, you accept, you get offered gigs from coast to coast, and Lethbridge always is worth visiting on any circumstance, but added a particular appeal saying yes to this. Looking forward to seeing so many of my friends. I'm very sorry not to be there in person. Um, I'm here virtually from Mississauga, which is on the lands of the Mississauga of the Credit Nation, uh, an Algonquian people. Uh, and we always acknowledge their land uh, claim and that we uh, uh, are uh, participating in the human adventure on lands that traditionally are theirs. And uh, I'm very happy from their territory to your territory to be reaching 2,500 kilometers across the country. My latest novel, there's the cover right behind me, is called The Oppenheimer Alternative. And it's my 24th book, my first novel. This is now, I'm looking at the calendar up here in the corner here, September. In two months, it will be 30 years since my first novel came out. That one was called Golden Fleece. And um, I averaged about a novel a year for about the first 20 odd years of my career, which is a good steady, reputable pace for a commercial fiction writer, science fiction, fantasy, romance, mystery, Western, thriller, one of the commercial fiction genres. Um, I had the unfortunate circumstance several years ago, well, nine now, of my younger brother uh, being diagnosed with lung cancer. And I asked to be released from the deadline for my 23rd novel by my publisher at the time, Penguin Canada. And my publisher in Canada and the United States said, don't worry about it, Rob, you're really good about deadlines. Uh, of course, right? You got a family crisis, deal with it. Well, I dealt with that. My younger brother passed away um, and I miss him. His name was Alan. I miss him every day. Uh, but I also realized that was kind of cool not having a deadline. So for this, for my 24th novel, for the first time ever in my career, I'd written a book well, not first time ever in my career, excuse me, first time in over two decades, at the beginning of your career, as most first-time novelists will know, or beginning uh, aspirant writers will know, you have to write a whole book before you can sell it. And then you graduate to a point where people will buy a book from you based on an outline, which might be as little as a few paragraphs, or it might be, depending on the writer and the editor, it might be many, many pages, but you get a commission. Well, I realized for this, my 24th novel, 
the Oppenheimer alternative. I didn't want to sell it in advance. I wanted to let the book take as long as it was going to take. Well, maybe having no deadline was not a great idea because it took four years to write this book. And I really only got around to wrapping it up when I realized that this year, and it was only about, let's say 18 months ago out of those four years that I kind of woke up one morning and said in good Homer Simpson fashion, don't, that this year, this summer that just passed would be the 75th anniversary of the birth of the atomic age. There were three significant uh, milestone birth dates uh, that we look back upon with uh, great sadness or at the very least ambivalence at this remove of three quarters of a century. On July 16th, 1945, the Oppenheimer, who is the title character in my book, J. Robert Oppenheimer, as scientific director of the Manhattan Project in Los Alamos, New Mexico, uh, brought to fruition the first ever atomic bomb explosion in, in human history. Now, as a science fiction writer, I like to point out that this device already had a name. It had had a name for decades, thanks to a science fiction writer, H.G. Wells, who is, uh, although not the father, well, he is the father, I would say, of, of the kind of science fiction I write. He's not the uh, progenitor of science fiction. It's important to remember uh, that science fiction was created by a woman, it was created by Mary Shelley. Mary Shelley, who was at the time only 19 years old, wrote a novel that in 2018, we celebrated the 200th anniversary of its publication. Frankenstein, or, and the subtitle is significant in our dialogue today, Frankenstein or, and here's a good trivia question to answer, what's the subtitle? The Modern Prometheus. Well, J. Robert Oppenheimer had a Pulitzer Prize winning biography written up. He was amongst the main characters, the Manhattan Project. He was the only one who never wrote an autobiography, which is one of the reasons I wanted to write from inside his head. He's the main character in my novel. In large measure, he was worth writing about because no one had, he had never disgorged what the thoughts were inside his head. And so we knew the overt actions he had taken in his life, but we didn't know even from his own point of view, why? And that's what made him interesting to write about. But the Pulitzer Prize winning biography of Oppenheimer by uh, Martin J. Sherwin and Kai Bird, both historians, is called American Prometheus. And both Mary Shelley and uh, Bird and Sherwin were alluding to the Greek myth of Prometheus, Prometheus being the mortal, the human, who had stolen the secret of fire from the gods. In the sense of the modern Prometheus, it was the fire of life, the quickening of flesh, the bringing back to, ex to living existence, dead matter, through the application of lightning and electricity, which is what Dr. Victor Frankenstein did. And in the real life story, Pre, uh, presaged in that science fiction novel of J. Robert Oppenheimer, he brought the power of the sun, the fire of the sun, which is powered by atomic reactions down to earth and set off the world's first atomic explosion, July 16th, 1945. And it, just to put a little bit of uh, historical perspective on that date, it was only 65 uh, from 45 to 69, all right? So what is that? That's uh, uh, 45 to, it's not that many years. Somebody can do the math. <laughs> that same date was the date that Apollo 11 took off in July, 1969 to go to the moon. It was nine plus 15 years, it was 24 years later that we went to the moon from this. So the uh, science just, galloped ahead in the middle of the 20th century. And J. Robert Oppenheimer was there for this. It was viewed by everybody as a great technological achievement. And then just three weeks later, July 16th to August uh, 6th, 1945, we went from the first test of an atomic bomb at Alamogordo, New Mexico, to the first use of an atomic bomb on human beings at Hiroshima, in Japan. Uh, 
where about 80,000 people were killed on the morning. And it was very early morning, 5.39 a.m. In the morning of August 6, 1945, the first bomb was dropped on Japan. And then just three days later, the second bomb was dropped on another city. The target had not been the name that now lives in history. We know the name. If I asked uh, the audience there to hold up your hand, half of you would know it was Nagasaki. That wasn't the original target. It was Kukura. Uh, and Kukura had the good luck and to the misfortune of Nagasaki being overcast three days later. And so the bombardier of the second plane, its name was Boxcar, Nola Gray, everybody knows the first one. Uh, the second plane that dropped the bomb there, the bombardier couldn't see the target at Kukura, and so flew on to the limits of the plane's ability, almost out of fuel, to reach another target that was visible, secondary target, Nagasaki. 50,000 people died that day. 80,000 three days earlier, 50,000. This is the tragedy. And I'll tell you what happened. My main character, Robert, J. Robert Oppenheimer, is a really good character for fiction, even though he was a real human being. Because uh, many uh, great literary critics, including amongst them the great Canadian one, Northrop Fry uh, of the University of Toronto, uh, used to say that every good story is a redemption story is a story of somebody making up for, finding a way to make recompense for. We would say today, as we deal more and more with the, the wisdom of our indigenous uh, community, of uh, finding restorative justice in what had been done. Well, there's no restorative justice you can do when you've slaughtered 130,000 people in 72 hours. But for Oppenheimer, the turning point was very direct for him. He believed it was necessary to create an atomic bomb. Initially, he was told, everybody was told, we'll create an atomic bomb to put an end to the worst human being of the 20th century possibly the worst human being of all time, Adolf Hitler. The Germans, the Nazis, the personification of absolute evil, genocidal monsters. And Hitler, uh, of course, hated the Jews, and Oppie was a Jew. And so was uh, Edward Teller, who was the father of the hydrogen bomb. And many of the other characters in this novel, Leo Zillard, who was not only the man who formulated the notion of an atomic chain reaction that made possible the atomic bomb, but was, these things are, you can't make them up, H.G. Wells' literary agent as well. And it was Wells who gave us this term, atomic bomb, all those decades prior to them actually making it. So science fiction, far from being escapism, science fiction is very often, I like to call it in a good Canadian metaphor, our distant early warning system for what's coming down the pike. And absolutely Wells said, later on in this, he said this early in the 20th century, later on in this century, we'll have these things and they will define the relationships between people and between nations. Now Oppenheimer was a scientist and they had not one, but two different designs for atomic bombs they were working on at Los Alamos. And again, it's trivia questions. You probably know the, the names if you stop and think about them. One was called Little Boy, and the other one was called Fat Man. They were names taken actually from noir detective fiction, which I'm very fond of. Some of you might have read my science fiction noir detective novel, Red Planet Blue. So I have a great fondness for this. The Thin Man is a character uh, in a, a series of novels uh, featuring Nick and Dora Charles. And the fat man is um, uh, Casper Gutman, the character uh, from the Maltese Falcon. And the difference between these two designs was not just that in their physical shape, but one, the thin man used very simple physics in it. Nothing that anybody didn't understand, nothing that was really outlandish or experimental. Indeed, Edward Teller, one of my characters, one of the real life characters in my novel, said to Oppie, I'm not even gonna work on this. This isn't even worthy of my intellect. Your grad students, he said, could build this bomb, right? Um, 
And that was the one that was used first. It was used on Hiroshima. But the second design, Batman, was all new physics. The, the original bomb was based on a very straightforward detonator mechanism that everybody understood using a naturally occurring, rare, but naturally occurring element, uranium-235, that everybody understood. But uranium-235, because it was rare, was hard to come by. They needed another kind of bomb that used a different kind of explosive element. And they used what was the first artificial element, plutonium. Uh, we've since discovered that plutonium occurs in vanishingly small quantities naturally. But at the time, it was thought to be an entirely artificial element. And a whole new way of setting off the bomb called an implosion, not an explosion, but an implosion bomb design that literally crushed a ball of plutonium down to an even smaller mass so that it would then explode outwards. Well, on July 16th, this little history lesson in short, then I'll do a reading. On July 16th, they set off a fat man bomb in New Mexico. They didn't need to even need to test. They never test thin, uh, thin man, fat um, man bomb in New Mexico. Uh, sorry, little boy. They never test little boy, which was thin man's other name, little boy. Uh, they had never even tested it. They tested a fat man in New Mexico and it worked. And Oppenheimer said to General Groves, the military head of the Manhattan Project, the war is over. And General Groves said something, this is way back in 1962 that Groves went public with it. It was classified, of course, during the war, but in his own autobiography, this is not new knowledge. 58 years ago, he told us, yes, he said to Oppie, as soon as we drop two bombs on Japan, two bombs, why two bombs? Because we have two different designs. What's the purpose of going on with the atomic bomb effort after Hitler had saved us the trouble by shooting his brains out in the bunker that he'd holed up in in Berlin in April of 1945? Why did we go ahead and continue to make the bomb? Why did we drop it on Japan? It wasn't necessary. Japan had been for a year by August, since August of 44 had been making overtures to surrender to the Allied powers, specifically to the Soviets. Their ambassador in uh, Moscow was conveying messages from the prime minister to the Soviet government. The Soviets were one of the big three allies. We were an ally, but we weren't one of the big three. We meaning Canada, big three, United States, Great Britain, the Soviet Union, uh, saying, look, we're done. We can't win this war. We know we can't win this war. Let's just let us surrender. We'll keep the emperor. He's holy to us. Name any other terms, we'll stand down. And the United States refused to stand down, refused to say, fine, you can keep your emperor, just surrender, because they were, and I use this term very advisedly, hell bent on dropping not one but two bombs on japan in fact tokyo suffered damage as bad as the damage as hiroshima suffered tokyo was never bombed atomically tokyo was bombed by sustained fire bombing and sendery bombs and uh, japan had a long tradition of wooden and even paper being used in the construction of buildings and houses, and firebombs would just destroy anything. So the United States government, particularly under the direction of General Groves, with the aid of my character Oppenheimer, had set aside a handful of Japanese cities to not be firebombed. They said, save these aside as pristine. Why? Not because we wanted to give the Japanese some infrastructure to move back into safely and rebuild their economy after the war, but because we wanted some cities that any damage to that was done during the war would be done by atomic weapons. So we could gauge how effective the two different types of atomic bombs were. And when Grove said that, that's what he meant. As soon as we test as soon as we drop, he means test. As soon as we drop one of each type and see what their effects are, then we'll, yeah, of course we'll let the Japanese surrender. For Oppie, that was a bridge too far. When they dropped the first bomb, he actually showed up that night 
the third of uh, sorry the sixth of August, nineteen forty-five, and did one of these, the famous thing a boxer does, the clasp hands held up in victory, and as his colleagues said, strutted. They'd never seen him walk like that. Strutted like a peacock across the stage at the auditorium at the Los Alamos Laboratory. Three days later, he was devastated. He went to Edward Teller, who was his bet noir kind of frenemy, we would say today, uh, friend and enemy, and said, I'm done. I will never work on atomic weapons again. And Teller said, why? He said, we dropped one bomb. I can see that. You know, the Japanese started the war in the Pacific. We had to end it. Why did we drop a second one? And Teller knew, well, to test both bomb designs. But Oppie said, we didn't give them a chance to surrender. We dropped this bomb. They'd never heard of an atomic bomb. Of course, it was a military secret. Uh, we dropped this bomb. We killed 80,000 people. We destroyed the railways, the roadways, the telegraph lines, the transmitters for the radio stations. There were no TV stations. This is 1945. The only way for word to get from Hiroshima to the government, the national government in Tokyo, is essentially by this point on foot. It takes three days to get word or more to Tokyo. The Tokyo government, the prime minister's office, first learned that an atomic bomb had been dropped on Hiroshima after the second bomb was dropped on Nagasaki. And they learned it from President Truman's press conference. That's how the Japanese government found There was no infrastructure. And Oppie said quite rightly, as an ethical man, we, one bomb, maybe, maybe there was a military necessity. That second bomb had nothing to do with militarism, with winning a war, with subduing an enemy. And it had everything to do with American uh, heartlessness. And now we would never say this today. This comes across a little racist, the way Oppie phrased it. Uh, but he, his refrain, starting with the dropping of the second bomb, he walked around for days and days. He really did. And what he kept saying was, those poor little people, those poor little people. Japanese of that era, mostly a, a low protein uh, diet, uh, uh, tended to be of shorter stature than Westerners. And he didn't mean it pejoratively. He was just devastated. Well, once the second drum was bomb dropped and the experiment had succeeded, we had now seen the devastating effects that both different bomb designs were capable of and had sent in immediately scientific teams to evaluate which was more effective, which one killed better, which one killed faster, which one did the most destruction, which one had the widest blast radius. We accepted the one term that Japan had been asking for for over a year. They get to keep their emperor on the throne, Hirohito was the emperor. I know that name well because he and I shared a birthday. Not the date. He was born years before me. But April 29th. If you're a Star Trek Voyager fan, you know Kate Mulgrew. Captain Janeway was born April 29th. Hirohito was born April 29th. And I was born April 29th. Hirohito, instead of being deposed after World War II or hung as a war criminal or anything, stayed on the throne for 48 years more years until he passed away of natural causes. It was all the Japanese wanted. They would have surrendered before any atomic bomb was necessary. Many members of the American military were telling Truman that. They knew the Japanese were uh, willing to surrender, but the necessity from the American military point of view of A, showing the Soviets that the Americans now had a super weapon that the Soviets did not, and Truman naively believed never would be able to possess, and B, having those actual in situ experimental test beds on living, breathing cities showing what the two different bomb designs could do. That was what the United States wanted to accomplish in the Pacific theater. And once it was done, the war was over like that. So I wanted to write a redemption story for Oppenheimer. And I'm not going to tell you about how or if he actually finds any redemption in all of this. Instead, I'm going to do a little bit of a, a reading for you uh, from the novel. Um, and what I do, this is a, 
it's a, I don't even know what to call this novel, if you'll forgive me, because it's uh, classified as a um, uh, alternate history novel. Okay, an alternate history novel is a novel that goes to a certain point and then there's a hinge. The standard example is The Man in the High Castle, speaking of World War II, where the hinge is instead of the Allies, that's us winning World War II, the Axis, that's them, the Japanese um, uh, uh, and uh, the Germans win World War II. All right. So everything after that point is fair game for telling a different kind of story. This is actually a secret history. A secret history does not contradict anything we know in the public record, but says that there is something much bigger going on behind the scenes. And indeed, there was something much bigger going on behind the scenes. We don't know what it was in real life. But we know when Oppenheimer was put on trial, and he was during the McCarthy period in 1953, for his communist associations, uh, he said to a reporter, if you, if a reporter, were to dig deeply enough, you would find that this story is much bigger than just my security clearance. Well, no, no reporter ever dug deeply enough. We don't know what Oppie was referring to, but apparently he was referring to something interesting. And I wrote that story in the Oppenheimer Alternative. But I'm going to read you a, a, a different scene from earlier in the book. And... I'm hoping that this isn't the scene I read at WordBridge. I have no record of what I read at WordBridge. So we'll just hope that I know there's not an off, but I know Alicia uh, is here. I know there's not a huge, and Robert Runte, there's not a huge overlap, but let's hope it's a different scene. There are 50 odd chapters in the novel. So I'm a betting man. And I'm going to say it isn't the same scene. This is a scene from the year before the bombs were dropped, 1944. Each chapter in the novel begins with a real life um, um, epigraph, uh, a statement uh, by a person that really happened. And this one is from Jean Tatlock. Jean was Oppie's mistress. Jean was a, uh, a psychiatrist who herself, like many a person, I know I, I did psychology at university or as an undergraduate uh, a minor, and half the students in class go into that field because they're looking for cheap therapy. Uh, Jean certainly was a very troubled soul. And this is what she said. I wanted to live and to give. And I got paralyzed somehow. I think I would have been a liability all my life. At least I could take away the burden of a paralyzed soul from a fighting world. And here's a little scene. Can I have a moment, doctor? Oppie prided himself on being able to recognize anyone he knew by their voice. And the one belonging to this speaker, deep, a tad oleaginous, made his stomach tighten. He swiveled his desk chair around. Certainly, Captain De Silva. As he beheld De Silva now, Oppie noted something odd in the man's bearing. His face, handsome enough, but always lifeless, like a Roman statue, was cocked at a strange angle, and his hands were apparently clasped behind his back, as if he were willing himself to appear at ease. I have news, he said. Noppy noted the small gap where an adjective, good, bad, had disappeared under a mental stroke of the captain's thick black marker. And if you share it, Hoppy offered, trying for lateness, <laughs> then we'll both have news. It's about your... The younger man aborted that run and started again. It concerns Miss Tatlock. Oppie felt his heart begin to race. He knew that the security people were aware of his relationship with Jean, knew that they, that she was or had been a member of the Communist Party, and yes, knew that seven months ago, when he'd taken that unauthorized trip to San Francisco, he'd spent the night with her. A lot of poker was played here on the Mesa, but Robert rarely joined in. 
Still, he was conscious that he was being scrutinized for tells. Yes, he said as <laughs> nonchalantly as he could. I figured you'd want to know, De Silva said. I I I'm sorry, sir, but she's dead. Hoppy's first thought was that this was some ruse, a test to see if, <laughs> if what? He'd flout security again? Surely Jean couldn't be gone. He'd have expected to hear through mutual friends, the, the servers perhaps, or directly from her father, John, now an emeritus professor. Word just came in, De Silva said, as if he'd read the suspicion in Robert's eyes. Honestly, sir, it's true. That it was De Silva breaking the news meant it was the fruit of surveillance. Had her phone been bugged? And if so, had that jackass, Pash, ordered it because Robert's last visit, <laughs> he realized his last visit ever to her back in June? Hoppy sagged in his chair. Jean was just 29 and had been in good physical health. That meant something like an automobile collision or good physical health. Did she... Was it an accident? Uh, I'm, I'm sorry, sir, but she took her own life. Both legs and arms went numb and the world blurred in front of him. Tell me, tell me the details, Hoppy said, fishing a Chesterfield from a crumpled pack and lighting it. Well, apparently, she'd agreed to phone her father last night, but failed to do so. He went by this morning to check on her and had to break in through a window. He found her body in the bathtub. Robert exhaled smoke and watched it rise toward the ceiling. Thoughts, some inchoate and some in words, percolated through his mind. Last year, he'd paid his 15 cents to see a recent flick called Casablanca in the base theater. He knew full well that the problem of problems of two little people didn't amount to a hill of beans in this crazy world. But still, he'd all but abandoned her, except for that one Fruit of night since his move to Los Alamos. Had his desertion, his dereliction of duty, led to that complicated, conflicted woman, the only woman he had ever truly loved, taking her life? His heart felt like a crumpled up craft paper bag, each expansion of it scratching his innards. He couldn't talk to Kitty about this, but he had to talk to someone. Our you as good at keeping secrets as you are at discovering them, Captain? De Silva opened his mouth to reply, but off he raised the hand holding his cigarette. No, no, I, I don't expect you to answer that. But let me tell you, Miss Tatlock, Jean, is a remarkable girl. In years gone by, we were close to marriage two times, but... Oppie trailed off, surprised by the way his throat caught more than his usual smoker's cough, a constriction as if his very core was loath to let out the words. <laughs> but both times, she took a step back. That much he'd say, but no more, not about her or <laughs> about him. She'd retreat each time she realized she was also attracted to women. And yet they shared so much tastes, interests and he could hardly fault someone else for being indeterminate for being uncertain for being both simultaneously this and that I, i'm sorry De silva said and oppie chose to accept the words as sincere she'd wanted to see me before i came here oppie continued but i couldn't not then it it was three months before i yes De silva said softly i know <laughs> of course you do Hoppy nodded curtly. I am deeply devoted to her. And yes, as you surely know, even after my marriage to Kitty, she and I have maintained... <sighs> he stopped, drew a breath, did maintain an intimate association. Such measured words, Hoppy thought. Why couldn't he just say it loudly and clearly? He loved Jean, loved her supple mind, loved her passionate convictions, loved her gentle, artistic spirit, loved... The wetness on his cheeks surprised him. 
and oft he lifted his empty hand to wipe the tear away. But another replaced it, joined soon by many more. Forgive me. The Silva's voice was gentle. There's nothing to forgive. But there was. He had failed her. He'd known all about her bouts of depression. They'd discussed them often, and he had talked her back from the brink more than once, even at last sharing the one time he'd contemplated taking his own life in the summer of 1926, whisked away to Brittany by his parents after what had seemed to his 21-year-old self a disastrous year socially and scientifically at Cambridge's Cavendish Laboratory. All still, despite his candor, despite his support, despite his love, still, Jean was gone. She'd introduced him to the poetry of John Donne, reciting it often from memory. Battered my heart, three-person God, she'd say. And now he knew what that truly meant, the trinity he didn't believe in inflicting a sorrow he was sure would never pass. Well, said the Silva, a man's man, a soldier, unused to emotional displays, I, I, I should leave you to your work. Again, doctor, my condolences. Thank you, Hoppy said. The Silva left gently, closing the naked wooden door behind him. The tears were coming freely now. He rarely paid much heed to his chronic cough, but the combination of sniffling and hacking was ghastly, and his hand wasn't steady enough to operate his silver lighter. It kept spitting flame near, but not near enough to the tip of his next cigarette. He swiveled his chair to look out the window, but the view of the mesa was as blurry as it was during a thunderstorm, even though it was a cloudless day. There was a rap on his inner office door. He didn't want to see anyone, and so he remained quiet. But the door swung open anyway, revealing Bob Serber. Have you heard? Serber trailed off as Oppie swung around, and he took in his face, doubtless red and puffy. Bob was silent for a moment, swimming in Oppie's vision. Then, can I get you anything? A, a drink, maybe? Roppy snorted, pulling mucus back up his nose. He shook his head. It's just awful, isn't it? Cerber said. She was so... But no single word could encapsulate Jean. And he settled on sweet. Oppie's own favorite description for an irresistible problem in science. Robert nodded, and after a moment more, and with a wan smile, Cerber withdrew. Oppie sat for a moment. It felt like an hour, although his wall clock said it was only 15 minutes, then got up. His secretary, Vera, had returned from wherever she'd been, well, the Silva Cerber had visited, and she too could see that he was distraught. But when she asked what was wrong, he simply said he was going for a walk. He headed outside and immediately ran into William Deke Parsons, the 42-year-old head of the Ordnance Division and second in command here at Los Alamos. Hey, Oppie, Deke began, but he too could clearly see the pain on Robert's face. A good Navy man, conservative and tradition-bound, Parsons was often at loggerheads with the free-willing civilian George Kistiakowski, who was spearheading a revolutionary implosion bomb approach. Oppie, hardly in the mood for another plea for arbitration, held up a hand before Deke could speak further. If it's about explosive lenses, Kisty wins. If it's anything else, you win. He continued walking. Even with his splayed-footed gait, he felt uneasy on his feet. There was a creme brulee crust of snow over the frozen mud. And now that he'd finally managed to light up again, the clouds emerging from his mouth were equal parts smoke and condensation. Ashley Pond was frozen, a giant cataract-covered eye staring heavenward. He made his way toward the stables, left over from the Los Alamos Ranch School. There were horses for rent here, but Oppie and Kitty, both acclaimed riders, each had their own. He saddled up Chico, his sleek 14-year-old chestnut, on a Sunday 
when he had hours to kill, Oppie would take the gelding from the east end of Santa Fe west toward the mountain trails. But today, he didn't want to bother with off-site security. Instead, he rode Chico around the perimeter of the mesa, just inside the barbed wire fence. Getting out to the edge took care, but Oppie was deaf, playing Chico like a musical instrument, bringing each hoof down individually in the perfect sequence to negotiate even the roughest terrain. They trotted at first as the horse warmed up, then cantered, then at last galloped faster and faster, faster still, circumnavigating the facility, an electron in an outermost orbit, no, 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 a proton hurtling in a cyclotron, building up speed with each lap, wind whipping Chico's mane, slapping Oppie's cheeks, flinging tears from his face and wails from his lungs. He urged his mount to even greater velocities, the horse responding with grim conviction, skeletal poplars raising by them as if one could outrun pain, outrun guilt, outrun love. Thank you. Thanks, Robert. That was great. Thank you. And with that, I'd be happy to take any questions if anybody has any. If anybody has any questions, you can quickly pop them into the question and answer. Um, I might have a chance to answer one or two. So if you get them in quickly, you can do that. If not, I'm happy to gibber on while we wait for a question. So my publisher is Red Deer Press, named for the city in Alberta. It started out as Red Deer College Press, mm -hmm. um, separated from the college after a time, moved to the campus of the University of Alberta, and uh, sorry, the University of Calgary, I should say, in Calgary, was uh, there for many years, and then was bought by a bigger publisher, Fitzhenry and Whiteside in Toronto, and is now based in Toronto. So it's had a long journey but it's still, as it says on the spine of the book, Red Deer Press. The cover was designed by a wonderful artist um, named um, Avery Olive, who lives in uh, now in uh, Red Deer, uh, Alberta. So uh, Alberta has had a big impact on my life and on this book. Oh. Uh, did anybody have a question? Yeah, so, so um, Joy asked, could you speak to the challenges of writing fiction about real life people who lived so recently? Sure, thank you, Joy. Uh, first, the get out of jail free card is that with one exception, they are all dead, which means there is no legal constra constraint. The moment the, co the coroner or the presiding uh, medical officer signs the death certificate, any rights in of reputation are expunged from that person and you can say whatever you want. Now that said, I tried to be fair to all these people. The advantage of them being dead so recently is that for every one of these characters that I wrote about, there were radio recordings, some TV interviews, film, lots and lots of pictures. If I was writing a novel set in the 1800s, say I was writing a novel about Darwin and Freud, great 18, um, Hunt, well, Freud was early 19th century, Darwin and, and you name somebody else from the 18th century, um, I would have very little to go on. Here I could hear their voices, their accents, the way they spoke. And that was a great advantage. The disadvantage, of course, is, as I said, it's a secret history. I'm constrained by what they really did. On the other hand, fiction has to be believable. Non, you know, you can have characters do something in a novel, but if they do something stupid, your reader will be really upset. They'll say, come on, only an idiot would do that. Oppenheimer brought down his own uh, career and that of his best friend in real life during these McCarthy-esque hearings that I alluded to. And when he was being grilled by the prosecutor on the witness stand, why did you do that, Dr. Oppenheimer? Oppenheimer's only answer was one you never could have gotten away with in a novel if there hadn't been historical truth to it. Because his only answer was, because I was an idiot. 
Here's the genius, a guy who's in charge of geniuses, right? He's the head genius of the biggest collection of geniuses ever made in the history of science. And he did monumentally idiotic things. And that was his character flaw. He was such a arrogant genius. He thought he could always talk himself out of any difficulty he got himself into. Well, he did not. So I was given the gift of larger than life characters that nobody would have believed Oh, come on, you can't be that brilliant and that stupid. Yeah, you can't. He really it was. Now, the downside is I mentioned all but one are dead. Well, that one who's alive is Oppie's son, Peter. Peter does appear in the novel. Oppie's daughter, who also appears in the novel, very sadly, like so many people, Jean, you saw in the scene there, committed suicide. Oppie's daughter committed suicide. A great number of people associated with Oppie committed suicide, and Oppie himself attempted it, as I alluded to in that scene. These are all tragic, tragic figures. But his son is still alive and does appear in the novel. Now, should I have asked his son's permission? A lot of people have said. Wouldn't that have been the cricket thing to do, old boy? Why don't you call up Peter? Suppose I had. Suppose I'd said, Peter, I'm going to write a novel about your dad. Oh, great. Nobody's ever told his story fairly and properly. And I'm going to talk about maybe how his abandonment left his uh, mistress bereft. And she committed, and he suicide. Oh, Mr. Sawyer, you know, I'm glad you're interested in my dad, but can't we let sleeping dogs lie? Yes, Oppie cheated. And my dad cheated over and over again on my mom. Yes. My dad's mistress died. Yes, he was a flawed person. Yes, he drank too much. Yes, he smoked himself to death. Do you have to dredge any of that up? And where would I be as a novelist? I'd be dead in the water, especially as a polite Canadian novelist. I would have to say, you're right. You've asked me nicely. I can't do it anymore. So I only spoke to people who knew the people I was writing about, Edward Teller's grad student, other people who had met Oppenheimer, but not anybody who could have had a familial claim, who could have said, out of decency, sir, have you know, to quote what was said at the, um, uh, um, by um, Adlai Stevenson uh, at the United Nations, have you, sir, in the end, no shred of decency left in you? I have a lot of decency, but I wanted to tell the truth. My, my responsibility is my audience, my editor, my publisher, and to history, not to the possibly gentle feelings of any family member. But it's a Perfect. great question, Joy. Thank you. Thanks, Robert. We're at time now, so we really appreciate um, listening to you. And the, your, uh, your excerpt was wonderful, and I think everybody thank really you. appreciate it. So thank you so much. I know it's a little bit different this year. Um, but we really appreciate you um, still taking the time to be here for Watts. I am so looking forward to seeing you people again. I would love to come back to WordBridge. I'll be at When Words Collide up in Calgary next summer, of course. Uh, you guys are so lucky for a town the size of Lethbridge. I know I'm going over to them. I'll just say you've got a spectacular library, a spectacular librarian, chief librarian in Elizabeth Egaret. You've got one of the only few remaining words on the street in the whole country, right? Bigger cities like Calgary and Ottawa and Kitchener-Waterloo lost theirs. You've still got one. You've got this fabulous festival in WordBridge that Alicia and Robert Runte and others bring to you every year. You are so incredibly lucky to have so many talented writers and passionate readers in your town. I would visit it in a heartbeat any day of the week. Well, thank you, Robert. And thanks everybody for participating. Cheers. Bye-bye. Thanks.